The affordable housing crisis was recognized by the state decades ago, and it continues to this day. Lawmakers say affordable housing is a top priority, but with the median prices of homes in two of Hawaii's four counties topping $1 million, are solutions really possible? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. It is certainly not a new problem in Hawaii, but it is perhaps more pressing than ever. In 1970, a state commission report called the lack of affordable housing a crisis. Fast forward to 2018, a state report found that on Oahu alone, more than 20,000 units need to be built to meet current demand. Politicians at every level pledge to make the issue a top priority, but the need still grows. So what do state lawmakers propose to do this year, and will they finally be able to make headway to help local residents find a place to live that they can actually afford. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email us or call with your questions. And we also encourage you to get involved with the conversation right now on our Facebook page. Now to our guests. State Senator Stanley Chang chairs the Senate Housing Committee. He represents District 9, which covers Hawaii Kai to Diamond Head. He's a Harvard Law School graduate and specialized in real estate law before being elected to the City Council. Kauai State Representative Nadine Nakamura chairs the Housing Committee in the State House. She serves House District 14, which covers Hanalei to Wailua. She previously served as Majority Whip in the House. Kenneth Storma Gibson is the Director of Housing Policy at the Hawaii Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice. She completed a master's degree in public affairs from UC Berkeley and wrote her thesis on affordable housing in Hawaii. And Lindsay Pacheco was at one time houseless and is the co-founder of Kapu e o Kaka'ako, a group of houseless people who organized in Kaka'ako Gateway Park in 2019. Group leaders are spearheading an effort to find land to serve as a permanent home for houseless people in urban Honolulu. Thank you all for being here tonight. Senator Chang, I want to start with you. I feel like I've honestly anchored this show before. We have been talking about this, as we noted in the intro for some time, well beyond when I even started here at Insights. Um, and yet this problem continues. There are a lot of forces that are beyond the state's control when you look at inflation, cost of building materials and whatnot. What can the state actually do? What is in lawmakers' control? Great question. Um, I think we have to start with funding. And I think this year, for the first time, we've seen a historic commitment by legislative leadership in both chambers, the $600 million proposal to fund Native Hawaiian housing at DHHL, for example. Um, that's more than the department, you know, gets in 30 years uh, worth of appropriations and can produce five or even 6,000 units of housing. So I think it starts with funding. I think it also um, extends to stimulating construction. The One of the shocking statistics that I learned recently is that back in the 1970s, when that report you were talking about was authored, we were actually producing as many as 12 or 14,000 housing units a year on Oahu. That has now dwindled to only about 1,200. Mm -hmm. So housing production has plunged by 90%. And I think that the recognition of that fact is stimulating people to try to identify um, the barriers to housing production and try to uh, overcome those barriers so that we can raise housing production up to a level that is healthy, that can accommodate the growth in our community. Representative Nakamura, do you agree? Do you think that it's a funding issue? What do you think is actually in the state's control and what can be done to actually fix this problem? I think uh, Senator Chang is correct that funding is a big part of the problem because it's so costly to develop affordable housing. And I'm really proud that in the House majority package, a senator said there's $600 million set aside for Department of Hawaiian Homelands, and it is a historic amount. Um, I'm also uh, happy that the my majority package includes funding for Ohana zones. Uh, extending the pilot program for another three years at $30 million more so that uh, fam so we can do more uh, housing for the homeless 
transitional housing, emergency shelters, assessment centers, navigation centers, and all the wraparound services that are needed. And then uh, finally, uh, we have uh, we are committed to doing more in the rental housing revolving fund by setting aside 150 million dollars for uh, families making between 61 and 100 percent of AMI because area median income because this group has been neglected and th these are our working families and we need to have uh, rental housing options for them. Well, I'm glad you brought up rentals. And Kenna, I want to turn to you on that. Where should the focus be right now? Should it be on rental housing or should we be trying to focus on home ownership? What are your thoughts? Both, both really. Now, first of all, we should be maximizing the federal money that we get towards rentals. And that's through the low income housing tax credit program. We're not maximizing that program right now. We're leaving federal money on the table. Um, because we need to put more funds into what Nakamura was talking about, the rental housing revolving fund. So we could be building 1,500 units a year if we were matching what we could, but instead we're at 700 to 1,000. So let's match those federal funds, maximize that program. And then in terms of, um, you know, for sale housing, I think Senator Chang is definitely onto something with essentially leasehold housing for the rest of us that are not beneficiaries. Um, a leasehold option makes a ton of sense. Uh, Rep Nakamura uh, on Kauai, there's that great program there, the um, Kauai leasehold housing, the county program, they have a waiting list of 400 people and they're only able to add a few homes a year. So, you know, I do think people want some sort of long-term uh, leasehold option. It's just a matter of working out all these details you have to figure out how a state program would work with county programs right um so so we have to work through that but people want an option where they can get a mortgage and it can stay affordable long term for the next buyer and the next buyer and the next buyer so i guess that's my short answer i think we're doing some good things we just need to do way more of that i think 600 million a year every year for housing is not too much to ask and i'm serious because what we're doing right now is expensive. It's expensive to have 6,000 houseless people. It's expensive to have so many renters barely hanging on. And it's expensive to lose so much of our middle class to leaving to the mainland. So, so I, you know, I can stop there, but, but we got to keep moving forward like this with big public investments. And then, you know, I, and I'll turn, you know, I'd love to hear from Lindsay what she thinks we really need for our houseless community members. Yeah, <laughs> Lindsay, let's hear from you for sure. As somebody who has actually navigated that journey and been able to go out of being houseless, tell us about what are the things that actually on the ground made the difference for you and for, for others you may know. Um, ooh, that's a good question. Um, what really made a difference for me um, was a lot of consistency within the caseworkers that I actually got to work with. Um, my idea of long-term solution doesn't lie in a shelter system because shelters are only temporary and they do not provide long-term housing unless, you know, the only way shelter systems really work is if there's long-term housing to put people into. Because, um, you know, if we, you can maximize the shelter system and people only end up right back out on the street if they have no place to go. If there's no housing for them to get into, it defeats the purpose of, of the system, of, of the services that's there. You know, I was fortunate enough to um, pass through one of the shelters, uh, which was Halimauli Ola out in San Island. And um, through that that um, through that shelter and that those services, I was able to get housing. I am currently um, on a housing first housing voucher so I, I totally advocate for housing first and I totally believe in housing first um, because if it wasn't for this housing voucher, I myself wouldn't be sitting here joining conversations with, with you folks right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was the idea of getting housed before getting my services. There is that great stigma and stereotype that people cannot be housed without getting 
drug treatment or getting help for mental health issues, I'm sorry, but I vouch for the opposite of that because I wasn't able to do any of that until I got housed. You know, the housing part is important. Um, but like I said, you know, it's great that we have shelters and we promote, you know, transitional shelters and emergency shelters, but it makes no sense if there's no long-term solution at the end of that tunnel to put people into. Hmm. Senator Chang, programs like Housing First don't work if there's no inventory. One of the um, things that you've proposed is a Singapore-style model that got a lot of buzz. I think we did some some programming here on Insights about that. Where is that idea right now? Is there a scaled-down version that folks are looking at? I know there was some pushback to that. Um, where where does that stand right now? So we're back with um, several bills this year to try to implement this solution. Um, as you know, because you've been following this issue for a few years now, it's um, there have been many different iterations and many different changes over the years. And um, I've been pleased to work with both Kenna and Representative Nakamura on this call to um, address some of the issues that they've really um, identified as ways to improve the bill. And so we the bill is moving forward this year. And um, I'm really excited because to what Lindsay was saying, what they do in Singapore, because the government is building so much public housing that is for all levels of income, for the middle class, um, even for the very rich, they're able to take folks who are previously houseless and put them into these integrated communities. What we know for a fact is that concentrating poverty does not work. And so you give people the best chance to get back on their feet by surrounding them with a community, a stable community. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one of the main factors as to why Singapore has really made uh, great strides on homelessness. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that we can follow in those footsteps um, for folks who are homeless, but also people who are, um, you know, just middle class folks who need housing. So the bill that you have moving forward right now, in a nutshell, because I don't want to get too sidetracked, but what exactly would it do and, and how likely do you think it is to actually pass? So the current proposal that we have would take state-owned lands near rail stations, specifically lands that are not part of the ceded lands corpus, and have the state build very high density housing to sell it to a range of incomes up to 140% of the area median income and um, to uh, allow for the program to be financially sustainable, although it, there would be an option to have subsidies for infrastructure, federal subsidies and other um, cash infusions into the program. And that this would really be a chance to provide a large scale, a large volume of housing for a wide variety of incomes for all Hawaii residents who would be owner occupants and who would own no other real property. So pretty much most local people. Um, as for its position right now, um, the bills are currently making their way through the Senate. I anticipate that they'll be brought to a vote on the floor of the Senate in the next uh, week or so. And then after that, they'll be sent over the House for the House's consideration. and because we've been working closely um, with the stakeholders, both in the House, such as Representative Nakamura, and in the, uh, in the nonprofit and other communities, and including the administration, we're, um, we're hopeful. I think we're in the best position out of the four years that I've introduced this proposal thus far to actually getting it over the finish line. So, Representative Nakamura, if uh, Senator Chang is successful in making it at least over to your side, uh, what are your thoughts on this proposal? Well, I'd like to take a close look at what the proposal says. Uh, I know that uh, Senator Chang has been working very closely to address the concerns raised in the Hawaii Appleseed study that was commissioned by uh, the state, uh, the state of uh, state of Hawaii. So, um, I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing how the bill has shaped up and the changes that have been made to address the concerns raised about how some things are different here, some of the best practices should be followed, and uh, we need to adjust the situation for uh, a different situation in Hawaii than Singapore. So I think, and I think Senator Chang is very sensitive to these issues, so I'm looking forward to reviewing that bill and, um, and others that are coming our way. 
We've got a lot of viewer questions I want to bring in some of them. Kenna, I'd like to have you ask, uh, answer this one from Richard. He says, how much of the problem of, affo of the affordable housing problem might be eased if we could use illegal short-term rentals for long-term local housing? This, of course, is a matter that's up to the counties. Uh, the Mayor Blangiardi says that this is a priority to crack down on these illegal short-term rentals. Um, is, would this, what, what kind of a difference would this make? What do you say to Richard? I say tax them. <laughs> I say if if you have a, 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 a vacation home, you should be paying taxes as though it was a hotel. Uh, instead of paying a very, very low property tax rate, pay a tax rate of 1.4%. What, what do we charge our hotels? With that tax money, we, we did um, some analysis in Maui. If you charged investment homeowners, second homeowners, uh, for a $2 million house, an extra $300 a month, okay? And for their short-term rentals, an extra $3 a day, you could get to about $57 million a year in added revenue. Now, that's very, very guaranteed income because property taxes are very, very secure. As we've seen during this pandemic, when other forms of revenue went down, property taxes actually went up, unfortunately, because the home values were disconnected from wages. But you can take that property tax revenue, put a bond on it. Now you have $1.1 billion. So my, my response to that is it's really hard to force private owners um, who is going to be in their home if it's a, you know, it, it's hard to force, but you can tax it. Interesting. Um, Lindsay, I want to get your perspective uh, on, tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing with your group to try to create housing. Uh, I want specifically looking at a Kauhale or affordable village style of housing uh, and then help that those folks get into permanent housing. Tell us a little bit about the work of your organization. Sure. Um, since late, I believe early 2018, late or yeah, early 2018, um, at one point we were proposed um, a piece of property that is not necessarily in a residential neighborhood. It's pretty much out of sight, out of mind um, area um, that we had had been, pro it was proposed to us that this would be a potential place where we could actually house our people, where we could actually develop a kauhale and you know build it from the ground up ourselves. However, because of issues with land transfers, going from the state to city and county, and then trying to be, you know, leased to a nonprofit entity, um, which is who we, we are working closely with to, to get that done. Um, there's just a lot of bureaucracy behind the scenes going or, or going about it, that we're still waiting to actually set foot on that piece of property, you know, like nearly three years later, or, you know, going on four years soon. Um, but that doesn't mean that we give up hope. We are currently in search of a piece of either private property or donated property or, you know, property that would that we could affordably actually lease out. And um, I'm not sure if you folks are familiar with Pu'uhono or Waianae and what they did. They literally raised, you know, over $3.5 million to flat out buy a 20 acre parcel of agriculture land out in Makaha Valley to where now they own their lot, their property. They can actually build their village, their Kauhale style village, which, you know, and Pohono Owainai is exactly who Kapo'e o Kaka'ako um, models after. We look up to them as if that's our sister organization, you know, um, and we, we're we trying to follow what, what, you know, follow them and replicate what they're doing, but in urban Honolulu. And of course we know urban Honolulu is so crowded already that it is pretty difficult to actually find a parcel or you know a piece of land, um, so that's that's where we're at. We're at that point where we're just trying to just trying to get a place, you know, the go ahead, the okay. Once we get that okay, then you know we can we can take it from there and at least have a safe place to to put a managed encampment and start building our kahale from the ground up. You know, that would be the work that the people living there would have to do, would have to contribute. And how yeah. how many families are you talking about? How many people? Um, when we were still in Kaka'ako before our encampment got dispersed, we were, um, a, a head count was last known about 120 people. Um, that included singles, couples, and, you know, some, a few families with children. However, um, since we've been swept out of Kaka'ako, the, um, of course, all the children that were in our encampment are now adults. So there's not too many, um, younger generations in our encamp or in our community anymore. 
But I'm sure the need is still great. Um, I, I want to bring this to uh, um, Representative Nakamura, excuse me. Stella from Kauai asked this question, so I want to give it to you. She says, hoping our legislature can take steps to promote housing slash ADU, which is um, on certain ag zone land. Any chance this would really help farmers? What about changing some zoning to allow for more housing? I, I think that um, we really have to work with the counties to identify the agricultural lands that are suitable for uh, housing development. A lot of, some of the ag lands are in um, areas, in remote areas uh, that would be difficult to bring infrastructure to and to support, and it'd be very costly. And so we have to work with the counties uh, to identify the lands, hopefully around on the neighbor islands, it's at near bus stations, and on Oahu, it's you know along the rapid transit line and bus stations, where it makes sense to do higher density development, and that way we can concentrate our infrastructure costs uh, uh, in in these areas. And we have this unprecedented opportunity now because uh, Congress last year passed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. That's going to bring 2.8 billion dollars to Hawaii in formula funds, and we'll have access to discretionary infrastructure funds as well. So we're working to see how we can best use those uh, infrastructure funds for housing development across the board, because we know there's a need across the continuum. So. Um, I think, you know, looking at ag lands, that's definitely one opportunity. We do have an, uh, uh, bills uh, taking a closer look at how we can um, improve the process to uh, uh, have ag lands uh, used for housing. Senator Chang, there's a comment here from Claudia Torres, and it's quite long, so uh, Claudia, forgive me, I'm going to sort of summarize it, but basically she says, to use the words affordable housing in Hawaii is laughable. Affordable housing is only for those who can afford it. Where does that leave everyone who can't? If you don't address a living wage, why bother? Those that need it will still not be able to pay unless the plan is to subsidize. Who ends up paying for it? So under what you're proposing, um, how do we make sure that the affordable housing is indeed affordable? Yeah, that's always one of the key sticking points that we get. Um, one thing that I've really tried to be clear about is that we're not just trying to build, you know, housing at the upper reaches of what's called workforce or reserved, where a single home could cost $867,000. I don't know anyone who thinks that's an affordable price. Um, the study that Appleseed conducted uh, last year indicated that it's possible for the state to build and sell a two-bedroom unit for only $400,000, less than half the price, which is affordable to a family making less than 60% of the AMI, of the area median income. And while I understand that $400,000 is still higher than, a lot of, than what a lot of folks can afford, it's dramatically below the market for a two-bedroom condo right now. And I know that because um, as you know, I recently got married. Um, we've been on the housing market and we had to pay a lot more for a two bedroom apartment that, uh, than $400,000. So we got to start somewhere. Um, Representative Nakamura, you know, really pointed out that Congress has made a commitment to infrastructure. It's now up to us, the state and the counties to maximize the use of those infrastructure dollars to enable the construction of housing. Because what we find time and again, whether it's in rural areas, as Representative Nakamura really highlighted, whether it's in urban areas, you have infrastructure capacity restrictions, whether it's wastewater, whether it's transportation. And um, it would be a real shame if those funds were spent on things that had nothing to do with housing instead of enabling the creation of large scale new housing development, which I think we can all agree here is our top priority. Um, I want to bring this question to Kenna. Yeah, please go ahead. I see you raising your hand. You want to weigh in there? I just I think this is important, which is that um, it's great to pay for the infrastructure and we need to do that. But what we want to be careful about is that when we put in that infrastructure, we're putting in a lot of publicly financed housing. Because if the financing comes from the private market, which means that developers have to go out and get investors to pay to build the housing, then most of that housing will be sold for market price, right? So this is basically what happened in Kaka'ako. We paid for the infrastructure, but most of that housing was financed 
by um, you know, private investors. And so it had to be sold mostly for market price, right? Whereas if you're using a model like DHHL, you are actually, the public is financing it up front and then getting that money back when people get mortgages or when they rent it, which is very similar to what Senator Chang is talking about with this leasehold model. So um, we need a lot more housing, but we need specifically more housing with public financing that's therefore reserved for local residents and that is not being sold for top market price. If we know that's the case, is there, you know, I think that there, we hear a lot of buzz around this idea of public-private partnerships. Everything is a public-private partnership, and that gets a lot of traction. Uh, the idea of the state or the government building that the kind of large-scale housing that you're talking about, what's the appetite from that among the public, from where you stand as a, as a researcher? I mean, how do people feel about that? Well, um, you know, uh, Lindsay lives in a, in a publicly financed, um, low-income housing tax credit building that was built by a private developer. It's a public-private partnership. The, the, the developers are private, right? You, you have Stanford Carr, you have um, Kali Watson, you have a lot of private developers um, doing it, but it's just that they get their money from the public side instead of have, having to chase down investors. So I don't know, Lindsay, what, how is your... <laughs> Um, well, I, I actually have a, I have, a, I have a different question for Lindsay that comes from Casey yeah. on Facebook that I actually want to get to. Um, it says, yes, people move out of poverty more quickly if they are in diverse communities. Would Hawaii Kai welcome several lower income housing unit clusters? I, I want to talk to you a little bit. You know, you mentioned all the red tape that your uh, project is going through, that your group is going through. But what has that process been like? Um, we all say that we want to create opportunities for folks to get out of houselessness, um, but, but on the ground. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, I'm not sure exactly. Can you explain just a little bit more? Like, well, yeah. I mean, what? How have your needs been, and how? How? What has the response been as you try to acquire this land? When you talk about the hurdles that you're encountering and the red tape, where is that coming from, and how could that be better addressed? What do you actually need? Um, we just need somebody to say okay. <laughs> basically um you know somebody to say okay you know give us the chance you know um no well what what's really happening um with that piece of property that i had mentioned earlier that um we are actually you know that has been proposed to us is you know i believe that there's um environmental assessments that need to be done there's permits that need to be drawn up you know what i mean there's um zoning needs to be changed because it's zoned federal right now so it needs to be you know that that zoning needs to change um and there's a ton of red you know a ton of hoops that we need to jump through to get you know just to get it and um what we need you know at one point the there was an emergent you know governor ega had a, a emergency proclamation you know that was declared at one point which had allowed Pu'uhonua wainai to continue with their development um, on an expedited permit pathway. And once that proclamation ended, that expedited permitting pathway ended. <laughs> we, you know, they they are still covered on it, but we cannot, you know, that's, that's basically what we would need is we would need another expedited pathway that would allow us to develop, you know, our property in the meantime, while, you know, everything else is getting sorted out and ironed out, you know, and fine tuned. And that, that's, basically what we really would need. <laughs> Representative Nakamura, I'd love for you to weigh yeah. in on this. Sure, I'd like to just add to uh, Lindsay's uh, comment about uh, expediting the pathways. So uh, in the current Ohana Zone uh, bill that's going mm -hmm. to the legislature, uh, you, know, we, the, you know, we heard from the counties, we heard from all of the advocates that these exemptions that expired when the governor's proclamation expired needs to be included in the bill. And that's exactly what was done uh, in committee. And I'm really happy that, uh, that we're being responsive. And we know that as long as home homelessness is, you know, we're the second highest homeless population in the nation per capita, uh, as long as it's a problem, we need to have these exemptions in place so we can expedite development. 
Senator Chang, uh, I know that you've looked at housing from a lot of different angles, and I'm interested in what you think of Heidi's question here. She writes via Facebook, what about the possibility of using underused school land grounds as property that could be developed? There have been talk about, you know, having a school at the lower level and building a, a condo unit above it. What about doing something like that? Yeah, I think that's a really promising idea. We have a lot of school lands that the state owns. Many of them are located near the rail transit stops on Oahu or near other transit centers in the other counties. And there's a lot of underutilized property out there. Um, one of the big pushes that we've been working on for years now is the need for teacher housing, because it turns out that one of the greatest barriers for teacher retention in the state is that with the salaries being what they are and the cost of housing being what it is, they simply can't afford to have a stable um, housing situation. And so whether we prioritize the faculty members at the schools that they're teaching at, whether we um, really build a lot of density so that we can accommodate the wider community as well, I think that's a very rich source of um, lands that we need to look at um, if we're gonna actually be able to build enough housing to move the needle in our housing shortage. You know, Kenna, there's a bunch of questions in here about um, foreign buyers, not foreign buyers, but out of state buyers. Can you tell us about the impact of that? Is that a red herring or how significant is the idea that uh, mainland buyers and others are coming in and sort of jumping, leapfrogging over local residents when it comes to purchasing homes? Oh, I do think that's a big issue. Um, I've I've heard, especially from neighbor islands, Maui and Hawaii, people saying that during the pandemic, you know, their schools all of a sudden, you know, a classroom, uh, a quarter of the classroom was brand new kids uh, from folks coming from the mainland. Um, you know, and we know, for example, that uh, on Kauai and Maui in 2020, almost 70% of all home sales were second homes. Now, I don't know for sure um, if they were from the mainland or from Canada or from another country. It's, it's hard to tell through the tax data exactly where that person lives. But I do know that they were not owner occupied homes, right? So they were a second home to somebody. And, and that's concerning it, if that much of our market that's out there is not being sold as a primary residence, right? Yeah. Um, so I think the concern as a, as a researcher is less, does that person live in Canada or does that person live in California and more, hey, when we have so many people that can't even afford a first home, right, maybe we need to tax some of these investment homes, some of these, you know, second, third, fourth homes to make sure everyone can have a first home. Representative Nakamura, Kauai, you know, you just heard Kenna there cite that as a prime example of the second, third, fourth home, perhaps. Um, you know, you don't necessarily want to punish someone for being successful, but you do want to make sure that everyone has opportunity to have a home. What do you say to that? What about the idea of really increasing taxes so that there is a substantial uh, contribution from that person if they decide that they want to have a vacation home in your district, let's say? Yeah, and I think that goes to the county uh, property taxes. Uh, they now are the only uh, entity in the state that can charge real property taxes unless we make a change to the state constitution, which there is a bill to do that, uh, and to change it around so that we um, increase our property tax and reduce our state income taxes. And that would be that way we can better direct our um, taxation and to fit with our policies to discourage out-of-state um, home buying and to encourage more local home ownership opportunities. Senator Chang, what so, are your thoughts on that? You know, I was on the city council in Honolulu when we first instituted the residential A property tax classification, which is non-homeowner occupied properties worth over $2 million. And over the years, that tax rate has increased to the point where it's now triple the homeowner occupied tax rate. Um, I always come back to thinking about my own family's experience. My dad was a UH professor, a state employee with one salary. He was able to buy the house that our family is still in today. He was able to retire comfortably. 
It's for me as a state employee with one salary to buy the same house that he bought in 1983 would cost over 40 years of my entire salary. The difference was not that in 1983, they taxed the pants off outside investors or that they prohibited you know, wealthy you know, people from speculating. The difference was that they were building 10 times the number of units that they're building today. And so to me, the focus on demand, um, while I think uh, it has its place, it's not by itself going to solve the problem. And building large scale new supply in my opinion, is both necessary and sufficient in solving the housing shortage here. Let's talk a little bit about the supply. We have two questions, one from Larry and uh, Makiki. Why does the state not allow mobile homes or modular housing? And Kelvin says, what about micro housing? Why not explore more of these options? What do you say to uh, Kelvin and to Larry on those ideas? Well, let me first address the micro units. You know, I'm a millennial, I just got married, I'd like to start a family. I have lived in a unit that was 168 square feet in size, the size of a small Asian hotel room. And I can tell you that we are not gonna be able to start a family in a unit of that size. I think it's a matter of generational equity. When we have the existing homeowner generation in Hawaii, you know, buying a home uh, for tens of thousands of dollars, that home price now having appreciated to a million dollars or more, and that is a quarter acre lot with, you know, three bedrooms or four bedrooms, um, that is what a lot of folks want to be able to raise a family. And so I, I, I get a really, um, I, I get a little touchy when it's implied that the next generation doesn't need a family sized home that it, that it should be content with a tiny home or a tiny unit. I, I just don't think that's fair. Uh, Kenna, what, what are your thoughts on the idea of micro housing or modular homes? What kind of a difference could that make? And, and is that something that we should be exploring? Well, I think we need everything in between. I mean, we, you know, um, Lindsay was talking about Pua and I, and you know, they're for them, they're trying to build these homes that basically cost about $75,000 to build. Um, and you know, on Kauai, there's that project at Pua Loke, I think that was about 120,000 for each of those homes. And, and the rent that they're paying is $500 a month for their own two or one bedroom apartment. I mean, you know, we do need a range and ultimately, yes, everybody should be having lots of space, but what do we do for the 6,000 houseless people now, right? What's that in between? Um, and, and maybe Lindsay could speak to like, what, what would feel affordable to you? <clears throat> um, if, if I may, um, I, I actually think that in the sense of dealing with homelessness and houseless folks, that yes, micro units, tiny homes can work. Um, because you give somebody who's living on the street that much space to call their own, you'd be amazed at how well they'll actually take care of it and pitch in to help take care of the next one and the next one. You know, so I think you're right. It, you know, it, it can work for the in-between. Maybe not, you know, for a single family who wants, you know, like um, Rep Chang said, you know, about um, a, a family who wants to start a family. Yeah, maybe not. But for on the house, this sense, yes, it could work. Okay, and represent, Representative Nakamura, why do we not have, you know, what, what, what do you say about mobile homes? You know, we talked a little bit about micro units, but what about mobile homes as well? Yeah, uh, you know, it goes back to the zoning codes uh, that the counties control, and mm -hmm. they, most of the zoning codes uh, require some attachment to the land. And so that, that's part of the, the problem because, for example, when there's a hurricane like on Kauai, uh, you know, these homes will, will lift and fly and could be a hazard to the next door neighbor. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it is a health and safety concern uh, that uh, gets raised at the county level. Senator Chang, uh, Ganma on Facebook says, why is Hawaii Public Housing Authority's wait list so long? I mean, years long. We hear about people waiting for solutions for some time. Under the model that you're proposing, how long is that wait and what do we do in the interim? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good question. Um, to get to the answer of that, we have to go back to the original 
idea of public housing. It was not designed to be for the poorest. It was designed to be a middle class solution. And um, what happened was under the Truman and then the Johnson administrations in the 40s, 50s, and then the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of federal funding that went into the program, billions and billions of dollars. And that's when the large scale projects like you know, KPT were developed. What happened was because they became these concentrated poverty developments, um, a lot of problems ensued from that. Um, and I think that as a nation, um, when Republican administrations came in, they really pared back the funding of public housing, which caused maintenance problems to develop, to develop which caused this vicious cycle. So um, the answer is not to stop. Um, the answer is actually to keep going. And that's really the only magic trick that jurisdictions like Singapore and Vienna have used is that they just never stopped building. They just kept building more and more and more every year. And what happened in Hawaii was that both public and private sector housing fell off a cliff. It plunged by 90% in the 1970s. Um, we basically stopped building. And as a result, um, there's, very, there's a huge shortage of public housing. As a result, there's a huge shortage of private housing. Now, I think um, we're starting to take those first steps, both as a nation and as a community. Um, at the federal level, you're seeing members of Congress talking about doing things like repealing the Fair Cloth Amendment, which is a cap on the number of public housing units nationwide. At the local level, um, one of the things that I was very surprised and dismayed to find was that there are 264 units that HPHA, the Public Housing Authority, owns that are not inhabited today because they don't meet health and safety standards. And so to bring those 264 units across all four counties up to those health and safety standards would take uh, an appropriation between 10 and $20 million. But once that's, once that's there, we can have these turnkey units. We wouldn't need to demolish anything. We wouldn't need to build on uh, new, any new projects. Those units are gonna be shovel ready for, um, for those who need them. And that's, I, I think, a hopeful sign that we're gonna be able to turn the trend on this. I mean, Lindsay, when you hear that, a number like that, that that many housing units are just sitting there vacant, um, you know, what goes through your mind? Well, I can understand that if it's not, you know, up to health and safety standards, yes. I mean, I would personally want it to be up to, up to par before I or my family or anybody I know moves in. So I understand, you know, the, the number, but that is a shocking number. Like that's 264 families that could be housed, you know, so, and, um, Kind of to to touch a little bit on um, the question that was asked, you know, why is the wait list so long? Um, I'm a college student now, and when when I was doing a research for one of my papers recently, I found out that the reason why um, public housing wait lists uh, are so long is because there's no time limit. Once somebody gets into a unit, they can stay there for an X amount of years until they vacate, either get evicted, pass away, move out, you know. But there's no time limit for somebody to stay in a unit. And, you know, in the meantime, like um, like Rep um, Senator Chang had said, right, that um, the building of the units stopped, you know, so we don't, you know, there is a shortage. So there isn't any more extra, you know, affordable, house, you know, Hawaii public housing units, um, aside from those 264 that, you know, need to be made available soon, you know, hopefully soon. But, um, you know, un unless there's more units being developed and added on, that wait list is going to stay there unless, you know, the next person moves out of a, 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 a unit that's already, you know, occupied to, to free up that space. And then, then the wait list can get, you know, tackled. Uh, Representative Nakamura, there's a question here from Eric and Kailua. He says, you've referred to the count, deferred to the counties a couple of times. The state has more resources. You make the laws. Why can't you do more? How likely is that constitutional change that you talked about to happen? That's one example where the state could have some more authority that they don't have now. Yeah, I, you know, there's the bill is moving through, uh, through the legislature. Uh, it's an, it's, you know, an idea on how we can try to do things differently. It will take this, the voters to agree to, to do this. And so it is in play. Uh, yes, the state has a lot of the resources. 
uh, that the counties don't have. And that's why we have the Hawaii Housing Finance Development Corporation, we have the Hawaii Public Housing Authority, uh, we have the Hawaii Community Development Authority, all who have a role in uh, housing, in developing housing. And so, yes, we, we uh, make a lot of resources available. Uh, last year, over $200 million went into the Re Rental Housing Revolving Fund. That's going, you know, and we continue to give a very high level of funding that the uh, the counties don't have access to, and that's why the counties, uh, that's why programs get done in in many of the counties. I'm really proud that the county of Kauai has taken an active role in housing development. Mm -hmm. They are doing housing development on their own, taking the risk of the developer purchasing lands years ago, decades ago, and now it's coming to fruition because they are, you know, by taking the risk, they went through the land use uh, processes, mm -hmm. got all the entitlements, the environmental work done, and, and the subdivision. They're, they, they're putting in infrastructure, and now they can go out, and, and then the developer has very little risk. And so now they're working, and they just awarded uh, one of the first phases of the Lima Ola project in mm -hmm. Eleele, and that's going to uh, result in how very affordable housing for kupuna and for families. Senator, Chang. so that's a great example, I think, of what um, of what can be done. Mm -hmm. Senator, Yenji, Chang. if I could, oh please go yeah, ahead. If I could just, if I could just chime in, you know, um, we do live in a nation of laws, and there is a reason why the federal, state, and local governments have different responsibilities. Both Representative Nakamura and I came from the county level of government, and so um, I think we're all, you know, we all agree that home rule is an important value. I do think that, you know, Representative Nakamura is one of the top advocates for um, doing as much as we can at the state level. I mean, one good example is a $600 million proposal for Department of Hawaiian Homelands funding, which is not subject to the county zoning codes. So that would be one example where the state is able to stimulate large scale housing production without some of the restrictions that other state departments and agencies might be subject to. And I've seen Representative Nakamura work hard to try to get more funding to the nonprofit self-help housing um, agencies, such as Habitat for Humanity, to try to build more, um, to enable counties and agencies at the state level to recover infrastructure costs um, through creative new ways, um, through the new tenants. And uh, I think that from the benefits that those infrastructure generate, and um, I think that it's important that we all have to recognize that we all have to work together. This is not a housing shortage that arose overnight, and it's not going to mm -hmm. be one that goes away overnight either. So, um, well, there's a it's... question here for you. I want to I want to give you, um, and I'm sure you've heard this uh, before. People don't want Hawaii to look like Singapore. It doesn't seem like these proposed units would be desirable. Who wants to live on an island that's a huge city? Arguably, uh, parts of this island are a huge city. But that said, there is a difference with with the aesthetic of Singapore and the aesthetic of Honolulu. So, what do you say to that? You know, that's a really um, that's a really interesting question because one fact that I always bring out that everyone is surprised by is that Honolulu actually has the fourth most skyscrapers in the United States after New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. We have more skyscrapers than San Francisco, Seattle, Denver, Houston, Dallas, Atlanta, Philadelphia, Miami, Washington, D.C., Boston, Minneapolis, all these cities that we think of as larger than Honolulu. And... I think it's, um, you know, even more than that. Um, I remember, you know, a question from uh, uh, that I got at a forum a little while back um, from an elderly lady who was, you know, saying that we 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 that we we cherish our way of life here in Hawaii, and and we do, and I and I strongly believe in that way of life here in Hawaii. The problem is that if we don't build enough housing, just like if we don't have enough cars or we don't buy enough shoes or we don't import enough food or enough energy, um, the reality is that our young people have to leave. Now, over half of all native Hawaiians in the world live outside Hawaii. Over half of all Hawaii-born college graduates live outside Hawaii. And if you would like to live in a Hawaii where you only get to see your kids and your grandkids maybe once, maybe twice a year, that is the reality 
that we have for ourselves. And, you know, that's the decision that we've been making as a policymaking community at the state and county level for generations now. I just wish we would be honest about it. And I wish we would say to our kids and our grandkids as they're graduating from high school, it's great that you were born and raised and educated here, but now that you're an adult, you have to leave. You cannot come back. This is not your home and will never be your home again because that's the decision that we've made for you. Um, to me, I don't think it's fair that young people are forced to leave and our community loses um, these incredibly, uh, you know, people who, who do love and, and deserve to have uh, the right to be housed here. Kenna, I want to um, bring in a few more questions before we run out of time. Heidi asks, could the state create rent control buildings with public-private partnerships, for example, tied to the building of the stadium? We've heard a lot about uh, the redevelopment happening around the stadium. How significant do you think projects around that area could be? We know that this is, you know, perhaps decades away, depending on Hawaii's timeline, but what are, you, what are your thoughts there? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's state-owned land already. A, a lot of it and um, no reason not to put up private, I mean, public money and then hire private developers, uh, just like what Kauai County is doing, really, um, you know, what DHHL does, what in some ways, um, you know, leasehold housing, the Singapore model, similar thing, uh, public money takes away the risk, but you're hiring private developers. And, and just I, I do want to touch on, you know, it doesn't all have to be a 30 story skyscraper we we can build housing that's appropriate for different neighborhoods that's appropriate for big island and maui and, and Kauai, and use that basic structure of public taking on some more risk but then using that to keep costs down for everyone and saying this is a hundred percent for local people who work and live here right so you know I, I completely agree with Senator Chang saying we all got to work together and we got to figure out a model where the state can support the counties and incentivize the counties and then recognize that something that works uh, in the stadium area is not going to be the same solution as what you need on Big Island, right? <laughs> Representative um, Nakamura, I want to go around and talk to each of you, so I'll start with you just to get a final thought because we are almost out of time. Uh, but just for folks who have followed this so closely for so long and feel frustrated, what do you say to them tonight about the solutions that you're working on? Yeah, I think I, I agree with Senator, what every, all the panelists have been talking about, how we have to work together. We have to, there's so many, so it's not a one size solution, it's multiple solutions. And from so many different lev levels and angles that we have to uh, confront. And uh, I think there's some really great bills going through the legislature that will help to move the discussion forward uh, to attack it the housing issue at so many different levels. But, um, oh, and, and one of the things that, uh, you know, we have to recognize are there's different strategies depending on the income group that we're targeting, because the way housing is developed here, the funding is tied to the income group that you're serving. So mm -hmm. you can get private financing if you, if, if you target the market group and sort of the high end working family group, but then you have to resort to public financing for some of the, the extremely low, low moderate income groups. And so we, we have to um, work together because there's mm -hmm. multiple strategies and we all have a role to fill. Senator Chang, a short final thought from you tonight. You know, um, over the course of the pandemic, with the worst economic crisis here in generations, with the highest unemployment rate in the United States, we did not see home values stabilize or go down. They only went up. And now three of the four counties of Hawaii have had ho house prices exceed the $1 million mark. I think that as horrifying and shocking as that is, I think it has helped to mobilize the um, officials of the state and the county. I'm seeing, you know, all these campaigns now for the major offices in 2022. Every single one of them says that housing is the top priority. And I think that it's become an issue that just can't be swept under the rug anymore. It does require hard choices. We are going to have to make trade-offs. There's no perfect one-size-fits-all solution, um, as Representative Nakamura said. But for the first time in years, I think it's safe to say that the political will is developing to um, actually solve this problem. Kenna, let's hear from you. 
I just agree that we all have to come together. That's really what's needed. Um, and it's at every level. We need our federal delegation helping us out. We need our state leaders. We need our county leaders. We need our people like Lindsay, leaders in, in the houseless community coming forward with their ideas. Um, but if we all keep listening and talking to each other and moving forward, we will make progress. This is not this is not finding the cure to brain cancer. Okay. <laughs> and Lindsay, I want to give you the final 30 seconds tonight. Thank you. Um, I, I totally agree. I, I agree that that things need to be done collaboratively together. Um, and it is nice to include more voices like my own or people with lived experiences at the decision making table. Um, because it's so easy for people who have never been in our shoes to try and make decisions and think that that'll solve the problem. But he, to, to hear it from people like me who've actually been through it, we can tell you what works and what doesn't work because we're the ones that have gone through it. So it, it helps to bring different approaches and different viewpoints to the table. And I, I agree. I think we all, you know, we all need to just get on the same page and work together. It's going to take all of us to solve this. Certainly. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Mahalo to you for joining us. Of course, we do thank our guests, Senator Stanley Chang, Representative Nadine Nakamura, the Director of Housing Policy from Hawaii Appleseed Center, Kenna Storma Gibson, and housing advocate Lindsay Pacheco. March is Women's History Month. We'll be speaking with experts about advancements women have made, but also what still needs to be done to close the existing gender equity gaps. Please do join us next week. I'm Yanji Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha.